So LinkedIn improved the latency by 60%. Let's understand what they did and how they achieved it. Page load times are extremely crucial for LinkedIn because it directly affects the user experience. Right? Now, obviously at that scale, they would not have a single gigantic monolith to power it. What they have is a ton of microservices. They use a framework called res.ly to power their microservices. This framework is built by them and they have also open sourced it. In production, they have more than 50,000 plus endpoints. Just imagine the sheer scale that they have, right? which is just powered by Restly. Now, when two services powered by Restly are using Restly framework, they talk to each other. They use JSON as a serialization format. And we all are very familiar with JSON as a format. But what happens is LinkedIn was not happy with this format because there are certain challenges with it. First thing first, credit where it's due. JSON is a great format. It's a great format for readability. When you look at JSON, you can very easily see what the data is about. It has amazing support across all languages. By default, any language that comes up, even if someone's writing a new language from scratch, would have a way to play around with JSON. Maybe directly, maybe through a library, whatever. But JSON almost has a great support across all languages. But this format is inefficient at scale. Let's go slightly deeper. The format JSON is a very textual format. It's very verbose in nature. For example, when I want to say that, hey, this is my JSON structure with two things, ID and name, I would have to specify that this is ID in double quotes, then followed by a semicolon, uh, then followed by a colon and then the value. Let's say integer string or string string, whatever. Right? Now, this is a very verbose word where I have to specify each attribute and its value. Right? While I'm looking at it, I would also have to wrap the attribute names with double quotes. All of this takes up bytes and it makes things more like it makes things less efficient at scale. Now, here looking at this format, given that the format is filled with brackets in case of list, it's wrapped with square brackets. Otherwise, it's wrapped with curly braces. Now, what happens is the incremental parsing of this format becomes expensive. You would have to almost always load the ent almost always load the entire JSON to understand what the structure is about. Right? So incremental parsing is inefficient. Third, that this format is not densely packed. That's it. It requires a lot of bytes to represent the data. Right? For example, I'll give a very trivial example for this. Let's say I have an integer, an ID, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, when I'm transmitting integer in JSON, I would literally send 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, these bytes, so 9 bytes to represent this integer. But I could have sent integer as integer in binary encoded form as 4 bytes. So this is where inefficiencies starts to kick in, that it is not densely packed and it becomes inefficient at scale. Now, when I'm transmitting a larger amount of data, this would also affect the network bandwidth. Apart from this, it would also consume more resources because I would have to spend time parsing that much or like accepting that much of data, parsing that, creating objects and then making it available for programming like for your language environments. You would say, but hey, if size is the problem, why don't we compress the data and transmit it? Yeah, compression is good. You can use a JZIP compression uh, or a snappy compression, anything. But compression is not free. For you to compress the data, you would also need a bit of RAM, and an additional CPU cycles to compress the data and decompress it on the other side. So nothing comes for free. This is where the inefficiencies of JSON creeps in, especially it becomes a bottleneck where the use case is highly performance critical. So what were the LinkedIn criteria to go for an alternative? The criteria was very, were very simple. First, compact payload sizes. They did not want, so for example, the integer example I gave, they did not want to take up nine bytes to transmit an integer, just the integer value. Now I'm not even talking about attribute. The packing needs to be extremely compact so that you conserve a lot of network bandwidth and reduce the latency because fewer bytes to send, sooner it would be received on the other side and you can start processing. So reduce latency, conserve bandwidth, key goals for compact payload size. Second is they wanted efficient serialization and deserialization that they should not be spending, like they should not be for example, waiting for an entire document to come to tell what it is. Again, this is this is just a trivial example for that. But the idea is the serialization and deserialization should be extremely fast and efficient. Because 
the quicker you do serialization and deserialization, you would be able to process that much of data faster. So this would improve your throughput. And third is it should have support across programming languages because you do not want to use something that is just used by a few languages and not all. Right? So support needs to be great. So what alternative did they went with? They went with Google protocol buffers. Right? In case you are unaware about Google protocol buffers, you are just a Google search away for that. But I have like this is something which is very heavily used with gRPC. So people typically think of Google protocol buffers in conjunction with gRPC. But Google protocol buffers can also be used in isolation. It is just a packing format. Right? I already have a video on RPC. I link it in the I card. So give it a watch if you are interested. Right? But what did they do? They instead of using JSON, they used like LinkedIn used Google protocol buffers. Now, okay, it's very clear that they use this, but how did they roll out? Because that's where when like thinking about using it is okay, doing a prototype is okay, but how do you ship this thing in production? So their rollout approach was very simple and, if, and effective. First of all, because they were using Restly, what they did is they shipped, they added the support for protocol, uh, sorry, for protobuf as their encoding format, as their serialization format and upgraded the version of res.ly in open source variant. Then for all of the services which were using res.ly, they all uh, bumped up their versions. They did not move to protobuf, they just bumped up their version. So now all the clients or everybody who is on Restly, they are now, they can support protobuf if they want to. But obviously supporting and directly start sending protobuf requests is a totally different beast altogether. So what they did is to roll this out gradually, the client, whenever used to send uh, the data in the protobuf format, used to set the header of content type header with application slash x hyphen protobuf2. When this request was hitting the server, server would know that whatever data I am getting is in this particular format. So it would use instead of JSON decoder, it would use protobuf decoder to basically parse the data and get the actual object out of it. Likewise, the server also would respond in a specific format. It might be JSON in the beginning and once it knows that, hey, I can now send it in protobuf also, it would send it to protobuf and set the respective content type header, the response content type header as application slash x hyphen protobuf2. This way, they gradually released or they gradually rolled out this feature to all the services while ensuring that when they were rolling out, fixing any bugs, issues, and they would obviously monitor if they are definitely getting the benefits or not. If everything is good, then they keep rolling out to 100% slowly and gradually. This way, without having any hiccups and more importantly, having a plan B of rollback that in case protobuf did not work out for a particular service, let me switch back to JSON. It was going to be very easy. They always had this plan B in mind. Okay, so this is how they did roll out. Now, what was the improvement and impact of it? The improvement of this was 60% improvement in latency, which is humongous at the scale at which LinkedIn operates. Right? And this is how one simple design decision, switching from one serialization format to another can yield such dramatic results. Now, one thing to note, and I'll just reiterate it again, I just said this a few minutes ago, is that they're not moving to gRPC yet, they have it in their future plans, but they just switched their serialization format from JSON to protobuf. Right? So just that one switch, just the change in serialization format gave them this result. When they move to gRPC, they can leverage a lot of HTTP2 features and a lot of gRPC features on top of that. And they have that in plan anyway, they have mentioned it in their blog. Right? This is what I found in blog. I'll also link the blog in the iCard give it a read. It's a very simple blog, but it's fun read. Right? So go through that. One key thing to highlight is the fact that if you observe most people, when they think of protobuf, they think of it in terms of it, like it being closely coupled with gRPC, but that's not the case. It's a packing format. You can use it if, even in your, even in your classic services, right? Not, not really you need to switch to gRPC to use it, right? This is a very interesting, like this is a very good example for that, right? So yeah, this is all what I wanted to cover in this one. I hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it amusing. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.